welcome to Musitations, Sound Healing and Sound Wisdom for a World in Need. On Musitations, we explore all things musical, meditative, and creative for healing, transformation, and awakening the relationship between nature, culture, and the soul. I'm Michael Branty Maria, and I'm your host and guide on this journey on the edge of a new millennium. I bring my 30 plus years of experience as an integrative wellness guide, best selling author, meditation, yoga, mindfulness teacher, and a four time Grammy nominated musician. Join me now on this adventure of awakening the soul. Welcome back to Musitations. I am so thrilled to have Susan Harper with us today. Susan and I have recently connected on the earth plane, but meeting her and getting a chance to work with her recently, I feel like I've felt uh, connected to a very dear old friend and s- total soul sister. So I'm going to tell you a little briefly about Susan. She's a continuum teacher, a heart-soul counselor, a creative instigator. I love that, creative instigator, an inspired teacher of perceptual and movement inquiry, and really uses sound, breath, and movement to transmit a primal and spiritual fluidity that inspires participation, resulting in embodied, innovative discoveries. And I also love that her students refer to her as a moving storyteller, a dream weaver, one who opens portals into the vast space of creativity, which is available in all human beings. I really was drawn to Susan because of her work with Emily Conrad. For those who don't know, Emily was an extraordinary pioneer in movement, breath, sound, in a deeply organic way. And I'm going to let Susan share more about that. Reading Emily's book, Life on Land, led me to Susan, and I just couldn't be more thrilled to have you as part of Musitations today. So without further ado, welcome, Susan, to Musitations. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to have you here. So there's so many places we could go, but I really, your website is called Continuum Montage, which people can find at continuummontage.com. Tell me a bit about why montage and how that connects for you with Continuum. Hmm. Yes, so montage is uh, like a collage and in 1977 with Michael Stearns, he and I formed a record company. And at that time, Michael was using a lot of world music, new synthesizer that was just getting invented, the Serge synthesizer, sounding um, indigenous instruments. And he felt like what he was doing was creating a montage. in all the different ways of making music. And then later, as I was exploring both movement and sound and breath, and also exploring dream work, perceiving work, um, wilderness awareness practices, to me it felt like my work was broadening into a, a larger spectrum of what it means to be human being in a creative process. And so the montage refers to a multifaceted approach to creativity, to being alive. And um, yeah, so continuum montage came in that way, uh, became an event and seminar name Mm. for the whole overall work. That's beautiful. You know, I, I really resonated, particularly just exploring your website. I found myself it was such a wonderful mirror because, you know, my life often feels like a montage or kind of this branching in all these different directions. And it was nice and comforting to see that um, all of these different streams or rivers that you travel and have traveled and explore and I could just, I could just feel that there is this sense of joy. And I'm just, just reading from some of the places on your website, from, you know, body of perception, body of relating, movement inquiry, 
wilderness depths, hearth of belonging, living dreams, mystery depths. You know, I love that there is this way in which you've allowed yourself to follow your curiosity, follow your interest. And I've always liked to say, you know, the soul is an old growth forest, should be like an old growth forest. It's diverse and, and uh, polyrhythmic. And, and I love that you brought up Michael because I, his planetary unfolding, I think that was the name of that, that piece that I was inspired by uh, Continuum and by your early work, I understand with Emily. Am I, is that correct? Yes, Michael was the live musician, one of many at, at an early stage of Continuum's development. And in the 75, 76 to 78 or 9 maybe, then Michael became more the primary musician for the live classes. And there was one day that Emily was speaking about this sensibility of listening, opening our listening as movers and as in our capacity for attention, to listen to the planetary unfolding, that mm. this process of planetary cosmic phenomena is an unfolding process, not a finished process. Mm. And uh, there was a very inspiring way that she was speaking about that and inviting all of us to listen into it. And Michael took that in, and then he came up in the moment with an extraordinary piece of music, and then that got put out uh, on an album called Planetary Unfolding. And all of us dancing that day, there was a sense of, of the music helping each one of us mm -hmm. ride into a larger flow of expression, but also the sense that we were all riding this planetary unfolding creative moment together, alone and together, in an improvised process. Mm -hmm. mm, it's so it's so moving to me to hear the backstory because I, when I first heard that and having been a fan of, you know, I mean, before there was such a thing as new age music or even ambient music, it was just beginning. But that piece in particular, but a lot of Michael's work had this organic energy to it, which is what you're exactly talking about. And And I found this in particular in reading Emily's book, again, Life on land, which just that, when I saw that title, I just, it's like, I had these chill bumps, you know, and, and having worked with indigenous people, as I know you have, in fact, I know you even had early years in, in Africa being shaped by your, uh, I think, as it says, uh, the land, the dancing and drumming of the Shona people in Zimbabwe, um, shaped your heart and bones. And, and I had that resonant in my, my body. I, you know, I, I grew up as a dancer and, and musician and, I I remember this sense of um, real connection to how all life began in the oceans. And when so many of these indigenous people who didn't have the scientific evidence that all life land in the ocean, they still intuited it. They understood that all life began in the oceans as this kind of great mother of, of movement. And I... And I know just in terms of opportunity to work with you, this relationship also between form and formless and that the water is this amazing formless place. But I, it's almost like if we could think of total formlessness as the air, the water is this subtle form, you know, kind of this bridge between the form and formless. And I find, and I think, I haven't talked about this a lot on musitations, but my native, my, or I should say my medicine name, my soul name is ever flowing on. And a lot of my soul tribe calls me ever. And so the, the element of water informs so much of what I do. So I was immediately drawn to continuum. And I love that she, you know, uh, the image of the octopus as this amazing being who, who lives in this place in between form and formless. So um, I would love to just know in, in your own way, um, this relationship between form and formless and how that informs this organic unfolding that we are, that's always ongoing. And as you said, unfinished, I think this is such an important 
skill for all of us, or maybe it's not a skill, a, a remembering, a, a, a dissolving into. I, I love when you talk about dissolving into our primal wisdom. So, so any of that, whatever hits from any of that that you might want to respond to. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So, water is so easy, um, not by anything you're saying, but in common, um, common culture to think of water in a commodity way mm. as an object mm. that we use, that we, that we use for all kinds of purposes. And yet water is a intelligent flowing force. And all the fluid dynamics that are invisible present themselves through the medium of water and through the medium of air. And water, if you observe water in its flowing process, in its freezing, melting, in its evaporating, it's a constant state changer. It's constantly shifting. And so we could say, if we really pay attention to the movement of water, that it's constantly forming and dissolving. And so we could question, does form... actually exist Mm. Uh, that there's a verb there there's a forming Mm. ongoingly if we take up like an old stone that's 400 million years old we could see it as solid that's the way we experience it through our senses but if we take a view and we stretch way 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 back in time we see that that is also a forming and a dissolving and it's living in whatever form it's in for some period of time but it's a process not a not a fixed static anything and water in the fluid dynamics is shaping our physicality so in utero we are basically an ongoing spiraling process of folding unfolding dissolving forming again and in tuning to water as you named that all life began began in water in the primal movement of pulsation and in the primal movement of waving and in the primal movement of um, arcing curling spiraling pouring evaporating becoming gaseous falling again and those are the primary processes inside of us. The latest information about water is that if you take all the various material parts of us away, we are actually 99% water molecules. Mm. So in one way we could say we're 70% water. That is relative space and materials. If you take all the material away, we're 99% water molecules. And that means that we are a fluid process ongoingly. So there's a lot of beautiful new information about hydration, and they're making a statement about a fourth stage of water called gelled water, or sometimes it's called, oh, I can't remember the other name of it. but it's just so beautiful to, to, to say what happens when we identify, we, we loosen our identification from a personality, social perspective for at least brief moments, come into the water fluid dynamics that we are. And then as soon as we touch that, we're enlivening, we are enlivening a system whose essential nature is wholeness, mm-hmm. fluidity, flexibility. Mm, thank you. I just so moved by that sharing that and remind you know that actually form itself may be a bit of an illusion. It's it's always a verb. It reminds me, you know, my, my Blackfoot teacher used to say, you know, Michael, I can speak Blackfoot almost all day long without uttering one noun. You know, that these in so many indigenous languages are very very verb based. Uh, I think they call it polysynthetic. You know, it's very 
based upon these uh, syllables or, or phonemes and that they they have the they're very fluid in their expression and and so it reminds me of like what you're saying is that this you know our English tends to to reify or noun everything you know turn things into to now that form itself but it's a beautiful image of form itself um, that that water is such a wonderful expression of that I think I read somewhere you actually worked with Maladoma, who I've worked with as well, and you know he would say so much that water was the uh, the African teacher Maladoma Patrice Somme, a a go between the spirit and matter. You know it is literally a, a portal between the worlds as well, and that yes, that it's alive. And my last album Ama, which means water in Cherokee, also mother or grandmother in dozens of languages around the world and love in latin and spanish and italian which i find that's fascinating water mother grandmother love and that that there's a way in which um, a deep resonance i know that's another term i love and continuum use so often is this resonant capacity and and how resonant water is, then that water is alive. Like I, in my shower, I talk to the water, you know, I talk to Amma. So I'm often, you know, I do a little prayer to Amma while I'm in the shower, while I'm washing my hands. And, and it's so comforting to think of water as a spirit, as a living, intelligent. And this, and I mean that in, in, in a very, as I know you do, I, I, I don't say that just metaphorically, that there there is something so deeply mysterious. In fact, my father, who was a PhD chemical engineer, even as a young boy, he would say, "We don't know what water is, even us scientists." We, and he would list all the mysteries of it. You know, its surface tension and the way it interacts, and and how it, in solid form, floats in liquid, which no other you know liquid does. And so, so I'm I'm always kind of in awe of water. But when I saw that continuum brought this together in such a deep profound way I'm really moved and 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 it's been such an education and this idea of yes the gel state this fourth state of matter or the fourth state of water which is just fascinating and i know and for those who don't know emily's work she, she even went you know her work with spinal cord injury to me is fascinating which we could take us probably down a, a rabbit hole but before going there or if we don't go there i would love to hear this connection between movement, breath, and sound. You know, I've done a lot of movement practices with people, a lot of sound practices, a lot of breath practices, but I love how continuum brings them together. And if there's anything you'd like to say about that, and and I do, doing the three-day dives with you, um, wow, it was so moving to have a chance to be given the freedom and support and container to allow those three things to, to, to live together. Mm -hmm. Yes. There's so many things that you just now have said. My, uh, my creative mind is moving all over the place. I'm going to answer that question, and I, I want to say one piece back to water just for a moment. Mm -hmm. And it's about liquid presence. Mm -hmm. It's like, why go to the water? Because of the presence and resonance capacity. Mm -hmm. And that water is such a resonant state. And you know those moments where we're feeling like a great affect of love arising we become fluid mm. we don't tighten then it's like if our love isn't isn't mutually accepted we tightened but in the moment where we're feeling great affection and openness in a loving moment we have a fluid expression in our physicality and in our emotionality and literally in the in the diaphragms in our body there's an opening and a spreading and a and a pulsation. So the liquid presence uh, in water and in humanity, in, um, in our connection there, 
it's just one of those places where we can really more directly experience that. Mm-hmm. And Mary Oliver, I often make this quote because I love it so much in one of her poems. She says, water says, take a drink. Water says, take a drink. Now you, like me, are a million years old. But if someone asks me how old I am, I'm not quick to say I'm a million years old because I'm not identified with what I actually am, an unfolding process. So in the cultural world, we're identified with our social personality spectrum And part of Continuum, the beauty of it is to help us touch something that's so below the cultural, social, personality-driven identity. And there we come to breathing and moving and sounding. These are ways to come to a sensation-based, sensual experience of being alive that's very immediate that each breath is right now. It's not yesterday, it's not tomorrow, it's right now. And there are practices from millennia about coming to breath for presence and for resonance in that every time we are breathing, we are really being breathed. We can say my breath, but really it's a planetary breathing body that's breathing each of us. We're in a primal exchange with all of the green living processes. And so as I play with breath and I connect with that potency of exchange, that I am one of the many places that breath dwells for a period of time. This air is landing inside my body, bringing nourishment and news of the universe, something that's no longer needed, but also my heart consciousness is pouring back out through the out-breath into an exchange. And in that place of tending uh, an aware sense of breath, how breath touches me inside, how breath caresses the inner soft tissues of the lungs and the throat and the trachea and the diaphragms, how all of those are moving is an inner movement that's already occurring inside of me. Whether I make a muscular movement or not, movement is occurring. And so to touch that, feel that, and to see, okay, I might have some psychological processes that tighten my diaphragms in a particular way. But if I play with breathing, if I explore breathing, if I inquire in breathing, I can help loosen some of those patterns. And sound is audible breath. And sound vibration is a movement in and of itself. It sings right into the tissues. It gives the inner soft connective tissue in us the um, fleshy, the liquid of us. It gives a vibration. And that vibration helps places where we have, through over-inhibition, through injury, where we have contraction, too much contraction, the sounding vibration can start to create a soft um, stimulation, a soft uh, vibratory movement that helps soften those tissues. And it reminds the tissues of their primal aliveness. Mm -hmm. And tissues like to be alive. They like their own aliveness. They like to flow and to be in exchange and to be in a play. So we play with breath and sound, sounding, breathing and sounding, to um, create a different kind of stimulation and play inside to help liberate um, old stuck patterns. And it helps open organic movement. And organic movement in us also wants to play, to explore, to come alive again. And so the openness of sounding, breathing, the exploring there, the the listening into what is the what is the movement impulse in the natural body that's beneath body image mm. that tends to get more fixed. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. I'm um, I'm sitting here stretching and playing with my toes and <laughs> I loved 
thank you for all of that. I, I loved your sharing during the workshop that, you know, when like oftentimes even when you first waking up, you'll kind of allow your feet and your, your fingers because partly from the literal sense of wanting to hydrate them, but also to kind of tune into that. I've even found my, I always I try to walk as much in barefoot or with my vibrams with my five fingers so I can, and just since the workshop, I've just been, I've been playing more, you know, with everything. And it's so funny how we'll get caught in these routines. And growing up as an athlete, certainly there was like, you know, I have these things that I'll do about this, you know, the, the strengthening or the stretching. And I teach yoga, but especially as I get older, I'll be 60 next year, that, that this sense of the fluidity, I can feel that start to get lost and and continuum and what I'm kind of exploring. And I I explore it more through music and continuum is inspiring me to, to do it through movement and breath because I've kind of been kind of discreet in my life. I sit, I do my meditation. I've been practicing Vipassana for 40 years, you know, and then I, I have my music that I do and then I have like my yoga and yet continuum bringing them together and and going back to the this sense of origin, I, I love when you shared about the million-year-old self. It reminds you, Joanna Macy will say, you know, she says, act your age. Well, let's act our age, our five billion-year-old self. And I have a sense, Emily would actually say our 14 billion-year-old self because she always, that's another thing I love that I both of you bring is earth and cosmos. You know, because there's not this split between the biological and the physical. There's really the sense of the continuum. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I didn't think about that till just now, how that, that also connects, not just the interplanetary, but she gave words to feelings I've had about this fractal within a fractal within a fractal, you know, and she talks about, you know, the birthing of the stars and the galaxy. And, but also I'm, I'm so moved by spirals and how these fractals and spirals are happening not just on the earth plane but this cosmic scale and so I, I really relate with all of that deeply and the sense of that the embryo too like how embryonic unfolding never ends that I, I love the sense of that that actually that original spiral wave and like the spiral wave has been my um kind of a symbol I've had my whole life. And so when I was reading about, you know, continuum, it's like these most basic movements. I was like, oh, I'm home. It's like, I'm not crazy. Like this other, this other. And of course it's the one petroglyph you find out of the five, six essential ones. The, the spiral wave is the only one that you find on all continents, which to me says so much right there. So and the fluid presence, I, I loved all that. So that moves me into another question, or I should say a another inquiry. You used the word, I was so delighted, that I'd never heard it used before, but it certainly also, again, expressed my experience, um, is musicianing. And you know, on my first vision quest 20 years ago now, I, I came a line from a poem that I wrote has become such a mantra for me, and that is each moment is a note in the song of today. Each moment is a note in the song of today. And I love you were guiding us through a number of breath practices and the sounding, and you just said in, in a musicianing, which you know I intuitively have a sense of what that is, but I'd love for you to speak to that and you know what that means for you and uh, I just delighted, it delighted my little inner child because I think I've been doing that since I was, can I remember, that I can remember. I've been singing in my own private language. I call it Michaelese. <laughs> so I would love to hear anything you have to share about musicianing. Thank you. That's so beautiful. That, mm. that sensibility of being a boy, mm. and musicianing, you're singing, you're inventing, you're improvising. And the resource of that, as you were perhaps also meeting some extremely difficult circumstances, as well as just joyous expression. Yeah. 
And the reason that I use musicianing, if we're encouraging someone to make a sound, there are many practices where the sounds are so specific about how do you make the sound that you, don't, you feel like you don't dare let your own creative improvisation happen. Mm-hmm. And so part of the purpose of making a sound and continuum is to feed and stimulate and encourage the, the, the biological tissues of us, the, f- the connective tissue, the flesh of us, to be a creative expression. And so when we make a sound, part of the intent of the sound is we put the emphasis on the feeling side, the sensuous experience of how does the sound feel as sensations, unfolding sensations. How does the sound travel? How does the sound permeate? Like like warm honey in, in the sun just permeating down into the earth and what it's like for the earth to have suddenly this golden liquid warmth movement happening inside of it. So part of the intention of the sounding is a kind of food, a nourishment for the for the tissues. And then so sometimes people can be get hung up on, well wait, exactly which kind of a sound do I make and exactly how do I do it? And there I encourage musicianing that let's say we're making an O sound and maybe I'll have you demonstrate it for a moment (laughs) is that we could if we had uh, 20 different people here and we each were truly free truly had full permission to musician our own O that all the variation and inside each of us that if I spent 10 minutes playing with the sound of oh how many different ways might I musician the shaping subtle shaping in the tongue in the mouth in the cave of the mouth and the throat to keep creating different pitches and shapings of an oh sound would you be willing to I'd just love to. for a moment sure sure musician an oh for us for a few minutes okay. I'm going to pause you there for one moment because it's so, so beautiful, all the little variations, nuance. But I'm going to ask all the listeners with the next O that you make, I'm going to ask everyone listening to not just hear the sound, not to hear your sound, Michael, but to hear, feel, listen, sense. How does Michael's sound travel through your ears as you're listening? Where do you feel it in your body? See if you can feel the bones that his sound resonates into, the place in the flesh of your of your heart, your chest, maybe you're somewhere in your head. See if you can hear, feel, mm. Michael sound. I okay. That. I love that. Oh. really tuning into how it was also moving in me too which is where it was resonating in my body and and all of a sudden my voice feels deeper (laughs) it's like so many things just opened inside Mm. is that it's exactly that place where we are actively musicianing and sensuously Mm. feeling Mm. our own sounding Mm. that makes the magic of it really happen for a physical organism Oh, I love that. You know, I having, you know, being a yoga meditation mindfulness teacher, I talk a lot about, um, especially doing yoga nidra, that the, the sensory body, the senses being a doorway. And I think that's what Continuum does so beautifully. And I'm curious about eros. 
and you know I, I kept finding that in my my reading of of Emily and I certainly feel that and and I to me eros eros that is such a points to something so unspeakable that that I I don't even really have words for it but I I want to I I find myself I'm putting my notes aside and I want to talk about that for a moment because I think particularly as westerners we're so divorced from eros in our lives we're so overly inhibited as you mentioned overly domesticated that we've lost the ability to trust our erotic unfolding as and we you know that separating it out just from sexuality or not that it, that's not on a continuum with it but that there is I don't know, I, I, I find myself simply wanting to hear your thoughts on how Eros is part of this whole work and and maybe is so almost synonymous with water in some ways, or at least how water moves, and but it feels like something even larger than that. Yes, Eros is a primal force of connecting. Mm. Mm. and relatedness Mm. it's our existential deep attraction for the so-called other Mm. and that's that's true like the eros of the the hummingbird and the flower Mm. they have an eros the eros of the green early shoot just sprouting out of the ground in the springtime and the eros of that green shoot longing for the sun, for its warmth, for its light, for the energy, and then receiving that. And that capacity to reach for and to receive is the medium of eros. It's the activity of eros. Mm. And it is like if I'm walking like somewhere in the desert, like on stone landscape, and I'm walking barefoot. And let's say it's not too hot yet, so the stone is warm but not too hot, and I can walk barefoot. And it's my feet's love of the stone, its texture, its warmth, its shape, its contour. That's an eros moment. Mm -hmm. And the eros of that, like, love of my feet, which is really the love of my heart, for this beautiful earth but to be actively touching and receiving that into my body into the whole length of my body and what it's like for the earth to have an eros filled human walking on it rather than somebody marching in just functional efficient mode not not paying any bit of attention whatsoever to the interconnectedness so in continuum eros is the the deep pleasure capacity of sensuality Mm. we have our nervous system as one part but now in the latest research about connective tissue the fascia is that there's 250 million sensory receptors this is not nervous system this is in the liquid fascia the crystalline liquid fascia that there's 250 million sensory receptors. This is meant for us to be a relational, moment by moment by moment, relational being with the ever-changing living landscape that we live in. This is how we are interconnected and how we as a physical, biological, and, and discrete organism that I'm relating to the ever-changing landscape so that I know when it's okay it feels just right the warmth of the stone and now okay maybe it's a little hot and I need a little bit of covering and then still that eros connection that's possible and when we get too efficient too functional too long it's when we lose the eros connection of relatedness and so in continuum sometimes we've all had like a busy day, we've had too much time on the computer, we've been in function too long, we haven't kept our sensuousness alive, which can be kept 
in a functional way, very much so. If we've lost it, then diving, we call it diving in continuum because you're swimming in the inner waters. You're swimming in the, <clears throat> the inner creative fields that are outside inside until there is no more outside inside. The Eros capacity is to sensuously be with what it is you're directly in contact with, whether it's way inside contact or the contact that I'm having right now as I sit here speaking with you, my, um, my bottom on the chair connecting with the support of the ground and like receiving the tonality of your voice when you speak and allowing the warmth and the deep tones, the resonance of your voice to touch me. That's an Eros-filled moment. And we have in modern world, it related so strongly to erotic, which erotic is beautiful, but it has taken another meaning, narrower meaning. It goes in the direction of too narrow of a range, that the only time I feel pleasure is when I'm stimulated sexually in a particular way. Way too narrow for what Eros really is about. So it can include the whole range of beautiful lovemaking and intense sensation. But Eros can be like the Eros of the, of the, of the, um, like just being first born and the arrows of just touching like the soft blanket or touching the warmth of someone who's holding me and the arrows that's there or the natural arrows that happens also between a student and a teacher where there's such a love for a similar theme or principle and all of a sudden we're in the arrows of delight of our shared realm of interest. Mm. Beautiful, Susan. Thank you. Yeah, I'm thought I, it makes me um, the phrase um, which a lot of people in embodiment work today. You know, the aliveness. You know, the aliveness of a moment. And I also I love this idea of this constant uh, improvisation and and what is most resonant in this moment might shift in the next. And and I I know we we both influenced by um and, and mark nepo who's a friend she's used some music on some of his programs i love mark says we must learn to fall in love with moment by moment course correction <laughs> and you know this idea again of, of musicianing or ever flowing or this this or you know it is it is a, it is a making love to the moment too or we could say when people see me play my flutes again it's like goodness it looks like you're making love to that flute and and it feels that way it feels very uh, becoming an an empty vessel for universe for earth to gaia to play me like it feels very much like being played um, as i know with continuous being moved being danced which also makes me wonder you know there were times and you 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 and the other continuum teachers did such a beautiful job of creating the, the container and the invitations and the inquiry to allow us to go to that place. And there are times when it would completely unfold. And there's other times I get stuck in my head, you know, I start over thinking I, I fall out of the flow. And I guess um, maybe, you know, as we're moving into kind of how we may bring this rich, you will have to do this again if you're open to it. Um, but what might be some practical senses of when we might find ourselves? Um, and, and these are, I'm, I'm just going to mention you know, this, this way of, I know it helped me when, when you discussed about the dis, all the ways to dissolve into a primordial wisdom. I think in our culture we think of, and for me it's also when I dissolve getting out of the turbulence of the intellectual mind, you know, and bring myself into the sensory motor body into the sensual into the into my embodiment just interiorize awareness you know interiorize and and i loved when you you both would talk about the the blood side of the skin i just just got chill bumps you know that this extraordinary uh, 
capacity that you bring in continuum, you know, because I've done a lot of embodiment work over the years, but this is a whole different level. There is such a tender yet fierce, loving, refocusing, I guess is a word I'm thinking to, to constantly come back to what is and, and this idea of being with what is, but also being open to what is possible. And, and, and also perhaps where this fluid presence that I am is being, is, is naturally or organically simply wanting to go. And it reminds me of when I remember reading, um, and Emily, had, I can't remember the, the researcher who she was working with, but when she finished this extraordinary dance and she wasn't winded or sweating and she, how did you do that? It's like, I just started a wave and followed it or let it, let it keep unfolding. And, and I, anyway, I get that so deeply, but for our listeners, you know, what are, you know, I know this is huge. It's less of a question than an inquiry. So you, you know, however you would love to respond to that. Mm -hmm. I think first of all, it's the kindness of attention Mm -hmm. that when one finds themselves stuck in obsessive moment of thinking, losing the flow, is there's a kindness for that part that has that that has that need somewhere I've popped up to my head because I somehow have something that I think I need to think about and so first part is just kindness that okay acceptance like that's what's happening and then this invitation to make another descent again, so-called descent, only in that when we're kind of stuck, it's not the most brilliant part of our intellect. It's the, it's the kind of repetitive thought process. And underneath that are some feelings. Somehow there are some feelings that need tending. And we have to find the way overall to come accept some other raw and sometimes painful things that are just needing metabolizing, digesting. You know, we we all, life delivers really strong experiences, and some of them are hard. They're they're illness, death, loss, sometimes it's beautiful. And so the deepening of incarnating is how do I come into this deeper descent, come to the blood side, of skin Mm -hmm. come to the inner intelligence of the organism and in part here we're coming to dwell in the natural body Mm -hmm. and to come out of body image or self image and this is something that wild animals don't have to struggle with they don't have a icon an image of the other there's a more immediate relating to one's own very direct moment-to-moment organismic experience and the moment of meeting, whatever it is that I'm meeting. And this ability to come in and, and sensuously feel, taste, what else is going on? The feelings that need to be felt and the what else that's also occurring. And there are a lot of embodiment practices. There are a lot out there. But many of them are working through body image and not descending deeply enough into the kind of more primal, organic, flowing intelligence. And this is something that's so novel in a way, I think, in Continuum because the movements aren't directed. They're more suggested. And there's movement motifs that open inside of us. And inside of us, we have a kind of an embodied imagination that we might be able to feel a serpentine movement, a serpentine consciousness, or a winged consciousness, and how to move in that way. Or something that hasn't ever even come into the phenomenal world yet. And we're meeting inside of us restrictions and constrictions and 
patterns that have been developed since childhood, that we're meeting that with a kindness of an openness of attention to be with that and to allow another kind of flow that's healing and creative simultaneously. Mm, that's beautiful. And that, that reminds me, you know, I, you, you know this, and I'm, I'm very open to share with the listeners, you know, I'm, I'm serving as a death doula with my dad right now. And it's been very challenging, you know, and, and uh, in 92 and a half, um, we've had some wonderful times. So we've also had our challenges. And this is not a man who uh, has cried or allowed him to feel much in his life. I, I remember up until this last Tuesday, him crying three times. Um, and I've carried some of that. And during our time together, I loved how you had us hold our hearts in, 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 in a way that went so much. Literally, you kept bringing us into, I could, it was almost as if there was a part of me that was inside of my body in a way that was, was very new. And this is something, I mean, I've been doing yoga nidra for 20 years and I consider myself, that's one of my, and I spend almost probably two hours a day. I usually, before sleep, I do yoga nidra first thing I wake up. And yet there is a way in which there's a middle space between that total formlessness and that is almost, you know, it's it's beautiful, it's powerful, it's going to that void. And yet this is this in between where to me water is about. So anyway, by going from that to then in one of my dives, I went to holding my psoas in the same way you guided us to hold our hearts. And Susan, I mean, just the the waves of grief that came up was so powerful. And, and, and grief I had been holding for months with my dad. And I think partly because he can't or has had a hard time going there. And it was a tremendous, powerful, and I, by, I think you were guiding us in such a gentle way to bring the gentleness of attention. I could just, oh, I could feel everything my psoas was holding. And I remember, you know, hearing that the psoas is sometimes in Taoist tradition called the, the muscle of the soul, you know. Um, so I have to share this with you. One of the updates since our workshop was, um, I've been trying to just keep a, a an open space with dad when I go to visit and, and he was in a very vulnerable state Tuesday and, um, he never cried over his father, his mother, or his brother passing away. His, his father passed away 48 years ago. And I just put my hand on his heart and said, you know, dad, um, it's okay to be vulnerable right now. And Susan, he cried for two hours. And he said, I don't know why I can only do this with you, but you know me, I've never known how. I've been a rock. <laughs> I've just been a rock my whole life, and I'm sorry. <laughs> and he was like, he went through being a little boy, crying for his father. Um, Babo is the, the affectionate uh, name for daddy in the Tuscan dialect of Italian. And, and Babo's gone, Babo's gone. And, and he recalled his father singing to him and I recalled him singing to us. He goes, I never put it together that I sang to you boys because my father did and I had forgotten all about it. And he started singing in Italian and, and uh, two hours of tears and, and then he fell right asleep. And so thank you. I mean, I really feel like the work I did in my body and opening allowed me to be in a much more softer, gentler space because I can, <laughs> he's triggered me with a lot of my own anger at times, you know, these in throughout my life. And even up a week ago, he was calling and, um, there was literally, I mean, the other side of that was, there was a moment when my, I had to get off of our workshop on zoom because he's, he's Michael, I'm sitting in the middle of the, I'm not leaving until you come, you've got to get up here right now. I said, dad, I love you. And you need to get in bed. <laughs> chill out and I'll be there when I get there. So this is the same man, you know, that four days later we had a breakthrough. 
Um, so I, I wanted to update you on that, actually, a little bit about, about that, but how we are resonators for each other. And, and I could see how my tension I was holding may have prevented, I was thinking I was holding space gently and yet by me doing my own grieving i i was able to open a space for his so so thank you for that thank you for that yeah so beautiful very very touching mm -hmm. and really truly it, it it does work just like that mm -hmm. that you contacting your heart and going deeply in the heart without a picture without an agenda without a movement map but just to actually genuinely penetrate mm -hmm. consciousness deep into the heart, feel what the heart's holding, mm -hmm. what the heart knows, what the heart has to say, mm -hmm. and the psoas in a similar way. And to allow that potency of grief that is generations, generations of fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers, that you're moving that grief for yourself the genuine true grief for yourself but also for them and it travels through time and it travels in the field and I have no doubt that that created an opening and that then when you're there and you're having your hands on his heart and and saying from your own vulnerability it's okay to be vulnerable dad this is a this is the moment and then to bear witness in such a feeling way his tears and to again be in the generational moment that there's a weeping that needs to happen and Melodoma Somme at one point I remember him saying that it's our tears that lubricates the way for the ancestors mm -hmm. uh -huh. and your own tears lubricating you and the soulful expression of that and then those helping lubricate his his way because you are going there and in death we meet all those patterns the the difficult ones often and then these tender moments that are so precious mm -hmm. and just last piece about that it's like when we come with a depth of listening to a heart to our own heart and come past our images of heart or our like somebody else's version of a pattern of the heart. This is what it's going to look like or feel like when we actually make the descent and truly get our hands on our own heart and get inside of our heart and to be able to rock our own heart and then to feel the weight of the heart and the space of the heart and the earth of the heart and the fluid spiral of the heart and then the emotional heart. All of that. Then we're making a a, a way in where the wisdom of our heart, feelings of the heart that need digesting and metabolizing can actually occur. And that's the, that's the beauty of, of a whole other level of incarnating this heart stream, this soul heart stream in this life. And it's like that. It's tender. It's fierce. It's wild. It's subtle. It's strong. It's, it's wild. Mm. Oh, that's just beautiful. Um, and it reminds me when you talked about the soul heart song, you know, and which is something near and dear to my, my life. And, um, and, and I do this little soul singing uh, workshop with people, which is very, it's just finding these tender places in the voice to land to then, and I would never use the word before, but musician, their own spontaneous soul song that resonates out of their body and um you know i had i had some real trauma with my fifth grade choir i loved singing and my voice was cracking and i i worshipped our choir director and and I, somebody's voice is is off key and made each one of us sing and you know, and I sang and I went off key and there's a hundred kids that were points at me and said, Di Maria, don't sing another word all semester. And I didn't, I didn't sing another word till that Native American sweat lodge, um, 20 years later at 31. And, and I think that we, we end up again, that's function over feeling, you know, and, and as you were talking 
about these intergenerational patterns and wounds. I I think what I love too that that, that there is this is a return. It's uh, in the way cross uh, countercultural um, that it is bringing back this this. I don't want to just say yin because continuum is a beautiful way of being in the Tao, which honoring honoring the polarities, honoring the yin and the yang. I mean, I, it isn't just that it's yin, but there's a very, I don't know, it gives me hope for the world, Susan. That's all I want to say is that that I'm just so moved by by the work and by what's unfolding. And everyone I have met in continuum, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so moved by, you know, I just... It seems like it's it's almost in those the process of becoming a teacher is is a bit of a soul initiation, you know that it that it it takes a lot. It's not you're not going to get it in a weekend, and there is a real kind of path of of growth that that just is really beautiful. So I know we're we could probably talk for hours, but I I know we're kind of coming up on time. But I I really want to let folks know if you're not aware of continuum if you're not aware of emily conrad or you're not aware of susan harper who we have on the show today please check them out there's just it's a wonderful uh, resource of living wisdom living embodied wisdom that that i'm so thrilled to have uh, begun to swim in a bit and it's been so nourishing um, so before we finish, Susan, any last words or anything you would like to share with our listeners about how they can find out about you, your work, your workshops? I actually want to say one thing back to what you just were telling about, which is that moment in the choir mm. and being asked to not sing. Mm. And then taking that, that's what we do. We take that as an image of ourself mm. and that freezes. And so then you didn't sing for 20 more years. Mm because we're caught in an in an inaccurate mirroring yeah and how beautiful that moment when you begin to sing again mm. that then your natural gift and your natural soul song and your natural body could express what was there all along that's that's cracking out of a false image body image mm. self image that we adopt, we all do it. It's exactly what happens. And I would encourage every listener to consider what what voices, reflections you got that are not accurate, that keep you bound, and to see. That's beautiful, thank you. And I wanna add to anyone else out there who might have that, and thank you, Susan. I, I think I really needed that. That as you were talking, I really also had the reflection, and I have thought of this before, the gift in that, was I'm I'm such a pleaser. I am such a recovering codependent that I I I know I would have totally devoted myself to more of a classical singing or more of a a trained vocal uh, experience and probably would have had much of the raw wonder and wildness of my unique voice trained out of me. And I, that's one of the reasons, you know, I, I play very non-traditionally. I love when I came across indigenous instruments because I don't, uh, I let go of reading music. I let go of all the rules. I actually break most of the rules, but, it, and they're layered improvisations. And I'm, my edge is actually beginning to share my voice more again. And because it's even more wild and more raw and more resonant with something larger than me. And and that's where in some ways I'm, I'm kind of glad I didn't have, cause we love, you know, like a Stevie Nicks, right. Or, you know, it's the often it's the most original and I was saying nature doesn't make copies, you know, it, it, each of us are such an original and yet that top down educating process of function, functioning versus feeling. And instead of singing from the inside out, we're going with that image. So although I had, it broke one image and it also created much suffering from a false image in a weird sort of way, maybe it protected me till this more raw original nature because when I, it was in that sweat lodge and I thought I was going to die on that fifth round and the sound started coming out of my mouth and it, it was definitely a rebirth of sorts. So thank you. Um, and I want to honor the, you, you just 
your listening and tracking, uh, being with you is, is such a gift because you are so present and I feel so heard and seen. And I, I'm just very grateful for you. And that was beautiful. The, what you named, that was very important. Mm-hmm. It's so true that these, these challenges are also gifts, mm-hmm. and protections in exactly the way you named. So thank you mm-hmm. for naming that. Yeah. So anything you'd like to share about how people can find a little bit more about you, your work, yeah. uh, anything else you'd like to share before we finish up? Yeah. At my website, continuummontage.com. Also, if you go to continuumteachers.com, there's all 80 of us continuum teachers that are listed there. There's many resources for ongoing weekly classes, workshops, um, longer intensives. And those who want to do some work with me, it's continuummontage.com. Great. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, Just so honored. I should mention one more thing. Yes, please. That is Elaine Calandrea um, at Watermark's, Watermark Arts made a documentary of me. It's on the first page of my website. If you go there, that's another good way to see and hear me. I highly recommend that. That was my, uh, and, and I don't know if I mentioned this, but you know, um, Liz uh, Cook, who was wrote Stock in the Wild So As, is the one who really introduced me to Emily and when I asked her who, you know, who's really carrying on the soul of Emily's work, and she said, without us missing a beat, oh, Susan Harper. She said, and she talked about many other teachers, but she said her experience with you and was so profound. And the first thing I had a chance to see was that documentary, and I highly recommend it as an amazing introduction to to you and your work. I'm so glad that uh, you you two were able to create that. Um, thank you so much. So honored to have you here, Susan. I just wish you all uh, the best and many blessings on your continued journey of sharing your gifts with the world. Thank you so much for, for this conversation. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. You've been listening to Musitations, sound healing and sound wisdom for a world in need, where we explore all things musical, meditative, and creative for healing, transformation, and awakening the soul. I've been your guide and host, Michael Brandt Di Maria. Feel free to check out my music on Pandora, Amazon Music, Spotify, XM Cirrus Radio, or Soundscapes Cable. You can also check out my website at michaeldemaria.com or online programs at alldaypeace.com, alldaypeace.com. Listen to your heart follow your soul, and we'll see you on the next episode of Musitations.